Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayech. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. Very few companies will uh, openly admit to the fact that they have failed. What do you think is uh, one of the biggest, or maybe in your eye, uh, misunderstood things about agile and agility? Well, uh, you know, fairness. I, I like analogies, and some people say mm-hmm. just cut the point, cut the you know, cut the chase. I like yeah. being around just leverage. I, th- I, I usually put this um, through through my own analogy, like tobacco and alcohol industries are tightly yeah. controlled in the United States and other places as well. You can't just start making cigarettes. You cannot s- just start making alcohol and sell it. You have to have a license. Mm-hmm. If you um, um, break the law, it, it, there are some repercussions. <clears throat> Agile has become the mainstream aftermarket um, business making, you know, entrepreneurship for many. Mm-hmm. And there some people make this because they want to make a lot of quick money. Large consultancies reinvent the wheel. Uh, mid-sized consultancies trying to follow big ones and uh, mm-hmm. trying to stay in the bandwagon. Also, uh, in fact, this is one of the biggest omissions and, and disservices to organizations, clients' organizations. But also our clients' organizations themselves, they, because it has become almost like a vicious cycle, mm-hmm. uh, People have lost the plot. They lost the authenticity and the initial meaning of the word agile, its intentions. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, today it, you will be. I'm shocked. I should be. I should no long, lo, no longer be shocked, but I still get shocked when you talk to some people at some large organization. People that are in charge of agile transformation and adoption. And you ask them uh, who wrote the Scrum Guide, and they wouldn't know. And you ask them to name at least one Agile Manifesto co-signers, and they wouldn't know. And what they are guided by are like internal design playbooks and mm-hmm. prescriptive manuals and you know executable files. We're talking about thousands and thousands of pages, wiki pages, confluence, wiki, box notes, uh, PowerPoints. So I think the biggest problem for me with Agile is that it has lost its initial authentic meaning. Like if you do a litmus test and anyone's, uh, almost anyone's meaning of the word Agile with the word adaptive or the synonymous word, it's, gonna not, it's not going to match. So <laughs> I think the biggest challenge for me is that it's just so much stuff out there that is no longer relevant. Yeah. So, How much do you think uh, uh, we're as coaches and consultants, the community that we're part of, how much have we contributed to that? Um, do, do, we get, do we get the easy pass or uh, are we uh, part of the problem as well? Well, we, I think we're part of the problem as well. Let me explain how. Um, and I'm going to be totally agnostic. I mean, you and I, we are in the part of a probably much better and more prof- much more professional community than uh, many others out there but even i'm just going to say i'm going to be very agnostic and generic <clears throat> people that are in business of uh giving superficial one-time flyby one-night stand training uh with certification which had mm-hmm. which has depreciated in value over the last few years dramatically i don't think they had much value with regards to you know, educating masses. Well, maybe they give, so, so they add value because they hopefully, and this is a big assumption, right? Those mm-hmm. better ones, they deliver uh, stuff on it at its authentic original value. But there are so many second and third market delivery people that just mm-hmm. snap certifications, at deep discount, resell through less than, appropriate and less than ethical, <laughs> ethically appropriate. Mm-hmm. 
uh, second and third resellers. So it's the, like I said, my, my initial statement was, it's not a tobacco or alcohol industry where you have to be very careful what you do. Mm-hmm. Everyone, their mother has a certification or accreditation or a license or a badge. So for, an, for a non-educated consumer, it's almost, it's so easy to get confused. I mean, there's so many of them out there today, especially online, you know, 9.99, 39.99, you get a badge. Some yeah. companies sell badges along with a false promise that because of this certification, someone is going to get hired. Yeah. We've seen this movie, right? Uh, staffing firms and some less than re- reputable um, shops out there. They would essentially pre- pre- present um, um, a, a training or a certification as the um, get your foot in the door, uh, you know, uh, green card <laughs> to get yeah. hired. And then once you pay for the, for the for the badge, they're gone. I've heard these stories. These are mm-hmm. unpleasant stories. And I feel sorry for the people that fell for this. Yeah, but like I recently wrote about this. Uh, I think I even uh, shared it with you about like, you know, the desire. Like I use this analogy between cooks and chefs and recipes. I and that. there's yeah. yeah. So there's so much, and you, I think you talked about it also in, in a, a context of shuhari, but like there's so many people that are looking for recipes and not necessarily wanting to become a chef or knowing, uh, not wanting to like understand the patterns behind the, uh, some of these frameworks. And what we get is that a lot of times people don't have the ingredients that we promise in these frameworks and they're not able to put anything together. So it's almost like a having recipe without ingredients or understanding how to put it together. So, And that you're right. And to my point, many companies are, you know, when you look at what an, an average company wants to do, they don't want, they don't really want to become a learning organization. They want to become an, um, an, an, an organization that has executed best practices according to some, you know, prescriptive guide, a playbook that most likely has been, syndicated and, 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 and created internally mm-hmm. or probably just as bad if it came from some large consulting firm that essentially sold it to them, you know, for $8,000, $8, dollars $9, a day. That's the mm-hmm. consultant service, right? And, you know, with a, with a, with a, it's a playbook. Take it. Take the deck. Why yeah. is it? Bad? It's because it's in the deck. And we've seen that, like you, you, you and I have worked with large organizations, publicly traded organizations, where one of the big companies comes in, and we're sitting at that same table with those big companies, and what the internal leadership is buying is the confidence, right? Uh, they're buying those playbooks. They, they, they're selling these big consulting companies, say, here's the playbook, or this is what we're going to do. And uh, how much does it have to do with the... Uh, the, the, the lack of leadership understanding organization of what they're buying and just buying the confidence, assuming that somebody can come in and fix their problems rather than them trying to fix their own problem. You're right. I agree with you. It's one of the biggest omissions I've seen. And you're right also. I fully agree that because people that are decision makers are not the same people that understand the impact, we get these mm-hmm bad decisions. I'm assuming there is nothing more grotesque about this when a large mm-hmm. company hires a large consultancy because they have a large badge. Mm-hmm. Because guess what? If they flunk, if they f- fall flat on their face, this whole effort, the the hiring company will say, well, that's the large consultancy's fault. I mean, they must have known better. So I'm mm-hmm. getting out of jail with a free card. I'm not, I'm not responsible. And that that's at the time of the, when, forgive my French, something hits the fence. But during mm-hmm. the initial state, of course, everything is hunky-dory. And how could they be wrong? They are mm-hmm. a multi-billion dollar company. Did you actually know that majority of their consultants are young, um, ambitious, uh, well-spoken, eloquent graduates from uh, best universities in the world, but with zero or very minimal industry experience? Mm-hmm. But when you take that, in combination with a very smooth, very well-polished PowerPoint deck and a Valentino suit, (laughs) 
that becomes a very big impact. Uh, it makes yeah. a very big impact. It makes a great impression on the hiring company. They can mm -hmm. be wrong. Yeah. So, um, they also, uh, they also like a lot of times, you know, one of the things that they do bring those large consulting companies in is either to help them be more efficient, right? Or either to, you know, save money. Um, and the fate, the way that they define agility or business agility is obviously different than probably what we would define it. Uh, I'm interested to know, like, how do you define uh, business agility? Uh, well, funny, funny you said that they they think it's they, they're going to be saving money. God knows, you and I cost one third <laughs> yeah. of what large consultancies um, charge simply because we don't have you know a gazillion of people in our you know um, digital perfection department to work on decks and and fine prints. Mm -hmm. We'll just give a value with almost no overhead, right? I mean, whatever our so anyway. That being and said, I'm not like, talking. I'm not talking uh, like saving in that instance. It's it's about like saving the company money in efficiencies in uh, uh, in other areas by actually uh, you know doing agile or adopting the agile practice or as you know like you know installing agile. Install, um, install so work. Uh, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. So, um, so the business agility to me is, first of all, I think this is um, business agility. It's a huge part of organizational agility. One thing I don't su support and I don't subscribe to is that when business agility or uh, agility in sales or agility in vendor management or agility in XYZ um, organizational domain is viewed as a standalone independent um, endeavor that can be, you know, literally treated uh, by its own and that is a silo. And one mm -hmm. of the reasons why I think this is happening is because, again, for the same reasons, for someone, hey, business agility is going to be a great mo momentum. Let's, let's do stuff in there. I've met some great people um, in business agility, business agility communities that really get it. They came, they come from a standpoint of organizational ecosystemic agility, and perhaps they spend more time with business people and, and, and users and customers. I get that. <clears throat> but for many people, it's just a way to justify why they don't want to focus on anything else. Mm -hmm. So I want to think of organizational systemic agility with business mm -hmm. being a part of it. So like take any organization, Business could be marketing, sales, operation, right? Then, then there's technology, then the HR, there's vendor mm -hmm. management, there's, you know, um, side strategies, you name it. Mm -hmm. So if we, I don't consider these independent entities. Mm -hmm. I consider them yeah. as a part of the much lar much bigger ecosystem. Yeah, I give an example, like, you know, if you go back about a year ago when the whole COVID crisis hit, and if you look at the uh, uh, the food industry, especially the grocery store industry, right? Um, yeah. I've had a couple of clients in that space, and they never saw themselves as IT companies, right? And then all of a sudden, when we had crisis and people couldn't go into the stores, they suffered. Because they weren't able to adjust. Uh, I had somebody tell me in Maine, somebody was, uh, you would put in order. Uh, this is March 2020. Uh, you would put in order. You wouldn't get half of the stuff. Uh, when you go to the grocery store, they would come out and take your credit card, go back and run it at the cashier, mm -hmm. come back, <laughs> give you your car back, uh, and then they will bring the groceries that they had for you. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I, first of all, uh, didn't want to deal with that crap. So, you know, I obviously went and shopped somewhere else where I usually don't shop, but they had that infrastructure already in place. And from a business agility, there are companies that actually benefited from this whole crisis. And there are also companies that actually just expose themselves to how vulnerable they are, uh, just in how quickly they can respond. Yeah, look, it's so. I was just talking to someone else earlier today, 
as much yeah. as COVID has caused so much damage and devastation. And, and, and I, I mean, I got the a very short end of the stick last year and I'll be mm-hmm. pretty open about that. Uh, but for some people and for some companies, it has been, <laughs> you know, uh, a rather more successful per- period because of, you know, maybe because they were in business of producing something that people needed most. Mm-hmm. Some people saved a ton because of not traveling and not commuting, s- s- you know, sparing on food. I mean, mm-hmm. it's almost, you have to take the good with the bad. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I speak from the from my own experience, and unfortunately, I didn't get that luxury. I know some people that did. I'm not jealous. I'm just stating what I what I know. Yeah. Uh, so late last year, you uh, I think it was in December. You wrote uh, agile lyrics poem, and uh, I'm just oh. gonna read here one <laughs> uh, one Please. part of it. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so. Agile's the way to advance for promotion. Don't miss opportunities. Strive with devotion. Scrum Master is a merely a junior role. An enterprise coaches your ultimate goal. And by the way, you got to, uh, first of all, thank you for quoting this. People that will be, if they watch it, uh, mm-hmm. hopefully they will understand there's an irony in this, right? People hopefully will <laughs> that very that very page with the lyrics. It's got the uh, the, the actual guitar play from a good friend of colleague of mine, Erin uh, Terry, and she she's I think she's an amazing singer and, and a guitar player. So she put it in music. So <laughs> we'll we'll include the video down on the bottom uh, in the description, and uh, people can check yeah. it out. I watched it, and it's uh, pretty good. But coming back to this topic, I mean, uh, it, yeah, yeah. you know, the, obviously the whole uh, uh, song resonated with me, but especially this part here. And, you know, coming back to our earlier discussion about like uh, just, you know, agile uh, and certification business, that a lot of people are just uh, seeing this as an opportunity to switch careers or make more money. Um, you know, Scrum Masters make anywhere from, you know, 100 plus K to 170. I've heard people make 170. Um, so so it's, it's a pretty good pay, at least here in the United States. Um, so a lot of people want to become Scrum Masters, not even knowing what it takes to be a good or really good Scrum Master. Um, and uh, what, yeah. yeah what so what are your that- thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? And uh, kind of as you were writing this poem, what was going through your head? Uh, it's so it's uh, so I'm um, mixed feelings, sadness. Um, yeah. So uh, some you know irony. I always like to turn everything I don't like into a sarcastic joke. Just yeah. helps me cope with it. And of course, and you probably have seen some of my uh, li- ridiculous graphics. Uh, you know, I'm, unlike other professional cartoon ca- cartoonists, I try to pretend that I am a cartoonist, but I try to put irony and dysfunction into, into, into graphics. So to my, mm-hmm. what went through my head at that time? So I, both you and I are, you know, have, and this is where you're going to keep me honest and tell me if your journey was light. We went through a very long journey of, of, of gaining uh, um, an accreditation by the organization that has been in business for many years. Mm-hmm. And maybe, you know, agree or disagree some about some of its history, but on the coaching front, it has been the most reputable organization out there. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the coaching, uh, the coaching offshoot, the coaching um, leg of it, and both of us, uh, you and I, have gone through, uh, went through a very challenging, a very long journey of becoming mm-hmm. uh, certified enterprise coaches. Literally, it was a journey. I mean, I kicked off my uh, journey in 2010, I think, and I went. When flat back, when when flattened flattened my back, in a couple of months after that, partially because of my own um, ignorance, I didn't do it right. Partially because of the process, which wasn't ideal. Mm-hmm. I said, you know, screw it. I won't come back to it until I have time, because it was never the main goal for me not to get a. I wasn't in pursuit of the batch. I did mm-hmm. my work. I was, you know, I think I was adding lots of value. I was learning. 
but like long story short, when I went through the process second the second time around, it was a long journey. Mm-hmm. Tons of learning along the way. And I bet you've done the same. It wasn't an easy gift to you, right? Yeah. And um, and I also have mentored many people uh, since then, t- people that were on the same journey. So I know people that really want to get this kind of accreditation, or, or this kind of credential, they invest a, sh- a ton, a ton load of time and effort into it. And money and, too. I mean, it, it's money, like I remember, I remember, like you know, going to and traveling to just meet some of these people to understand from their perspective, observe. So it was like a commitment. Uh, not just from that, but like uh, it, it was financial commitment too, because it required you to uh, uh, to put a lot of this into practice to show what you've done, and also uh, to build relationships. Too. Yep, yeah. I'm I'm totally with you on this. And uh, so the sad part is this: it is me and you and and a bunch of other people, a small fraction of people that really takes this seriously, took it seriously today. Uh, and this is because of the supply and demand thing. And I wrote about this many times as well. Everyone, their mother is an enterprise coach. Mm-hmm. I got, so you can always look them up graphics and even funny SQL, I call it, as when, when, the, when the HR database is being updated overnight with the SQL statement where you update values, senior project manager, senior agile coach, junior project manager, <laughs> scrum master. For crying out loud, if that's what you do, then why would you expect your organization to, to change? Um, yeah. So for many people, it's, it's a fast track uh, just because there was a bang wagon moving at high speed. Agile, agile, let's jump in on the bag wagon. So it looks like my PMO responsibilities are winding down. Uh, where, where is that you know, next train that I need to jump on? Yeah. Next agile release train to jump on, right? So what would you uh, what would you uh, tell somebody that is serious um, that it's not just about uh, their goal is not enterprise agile as you said here it's, it's not the ultimate goal but it's the journey they really do want to become uh, a really good uh, uh, organizational and agile coach what would you say like what would you recommend somebody just starting out right now look there, or what a- would you do? If, yeah. you, if you were signed, what would you do, given given the uh, you know what you know now? Look, today we our people, oper- there are more opportunities today to pursue the the same journey you and I went through than there was ten years ago, or five mm-hmm. even five years ago. So, you know, we got mentoring programs. We got people like you and I that are out there could probably give some guidance and help. There, there is a, there is a, there is a there is a will, there is a way. Yeah. The challenge today, and by the way, tell me if you think otherwise, if you disagree, but even today, majority of companies do not have recognition for a certified enterprise coach by Scrum Alliance or mm-hmm. a certified team coach by Scrum Alliance as much as they should. Because these are the best people out there. But because the word agile has been grossly, grotesquely diluted, Mm-hmm. It just rubs up, rubs up the wrong way. Anyone you walk in, the, you walk in the organization. Anyone who was has been at a certain pay grade, and so it's like an if statement. If you are at a certain pay grade, and if you want to do agile, then you will be some sort of an enterprise person. Mm-hmm. If you want to do agile, and if you are at the junior pay grade, then your options are a scrum master or, you know, a, 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 some sort of a ill-defined team level BA, BA-like product owner. Mm-hmm. Just because the pay grade isn't there, enough. it doesn't give you enough opportunity. So um, I would recommend people that are really genuine about this still pursue the right way. I mean, there are ways to advance themselves. Education, the, look, what we have today is so much more um, there's so there's so much more richness now than we we had back when we were doing this. So I think there's a will, there's a way. The challenge yeah. because of course that the market the market has been grossly diluted. So I, I just like I would recommend to individuals not to shy away from pursuing this as mm-hmm. a 
opportunity. I would also recommend companies that hire be much more uh, discriminative and more scrutinizing when it comes to picking their talent, you know, bringing on talent. Yeah, so it's both ends, uh, organizations being able to kind of screen and hire better, but also for right. people that are interested pursuing. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I say in analogy that you, which goes back to, you know, what you said about there's a lot more opportunities today because there are more companies that are interested in <laughs> pursuing yeah. these agile ways of working. Um, the way that I, you know, explain and I use another analogy, which is like, you know, uh, I grew up in Sarajevo and 1984 Olympics were held in Sarajevo. So skiing is big there, you know, um, and skiing in Sarajevo is different uh, than in Maine or New Hampshire or Vermont, uh, where my family or, you know, we, uh, when we came to the United States, we came to Maine and, you know, I continued skiing up there, but it's totally different. You know, we joke around, it's more like skating down the bunny hills because uh, it's icy and <laughs> there's no really mountains. These are just, you know, uh, large uh, hills compared to, you know, what we see yeah. in Europe. Um, and then, you know, when I move out here west, um, it's different type of terrain. So a lot of times scrum masters are like comfortable in their own, uh, on their own mountain, in their own organization, on their own team. They're not willing to say, hey, you know, I'm going to take a risk and go somewhere else and get some more experience. And then I'm going to go somewhere else and get more experience. So it's like analogous to like having, you know, skied in many different conditions and areas so you can become a well-rounded skier. And uh, I don't see many people willing to take that risk. I used to take that risk and I would, uh, you know, obviously uh, 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 it was easier when you're younger, but I think that's what shaped my journey and made it, uh, easier, not easier, but as far as learning faster, um, is I was able and willing to do that. So it's funny you say this. You see, uh, for people that are really into the role, uh, so people people that are into entrepreneurship and and discovery and learning, they welcome these challenges and they welcome mm -hmm. these opportunities to you know to to change organizations. Maybe if it's a large enough organization, you know, as the first step would be to uh, change different, you know, divisions or different organizational verticals going from one to another. Although someone could uh, rightfully argue that if, as long as you're under the same logo, you're pretty much in the same structure and culture, which is true. Too. <laughs> yeah. You still can improvise. But people that just want to get, you know, get by and, and are there for a ride, they really don't see much value in learning. They just, they, I call them fast trackers because there's a you know, fast, 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 you know, mm -hmm. off, up, up the chain of command. Those people will not be so much interested in, in, in pursuing opportunities elsewhere. So they will be just very sedentary, very, um, you know, very, very localized. And they, of mm -hmm. course, their mindset will be very limited, very, uh, very, very um, uh, narrow. So. I think this is a good indicator. I call these domesticated people, <laughs> institutionalized <laughs> people. Yeah. Maybe it's not a good way. To, I mean, I, I've, yeah. I, I treat others the way, the same exact way I, I, I want people to treat me. So yeah. I think if you've been with the same organization for 15, 20 years and haven't seen a daylight, then it's almost impossible for you to you know, you, we can't expect anything from that person, especially if that person didn't get out much. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to like you know, both you, both uh, you and I uh, immigrated to this country, and I think you know it's similar like that. Like when you're exposed to the completely different environment, a di different culture, you kind of start seeing things from a different perspective. Things that you saw in your own bubble now start looking a little bit differently than uh, uh, than what they did when when you were in that bubble. I agree. True. Very true. And I'll, I'll go even as far as to say, you know, this is, you know, we don't want to digress outside of the, <laughs> this conversation into, you know, history or politics. Uh, uh, people, many people that I've met in my life, you know, during, I'd say at least the last 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. the most, some of them are very successful in their own ways just because they have become very successful in their own little, in, in, in I'm sorry, in their own yeah. bubble. Yeah. Their bubble is pretty big, but it's still a bubble. So, yeah. so 
people... So you're saying it's like, it's not necessarily the indicator of, uh, but usually, yeah, usually it might be helpful to change perspectives, I guess, and look at things exactly, different. Exactly. Yeah. Whether it's history or politics or, or, or some, or anything else, um, there's an, I think there's a wisdom, right? You, you, you're, depending where you, you, you sit, you stand in your views, depending on where you sit, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, so you've been involved with the community in so many different ways, and uh, one of the things that uh, I really enjoy is, uh, uh, especially in the last year, what you've done with the uh, New York uh, or the, uh, the less community in New York. And uh, as far as I know, like it's the biggest less community out there. Um, and it's most active. I think, you know, one of the nice things that I see is, you know, the, 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 the uh, caliber of speakers that you bring. And uh, I was watching your interview with uh, Dave Snowden. And uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, and uh, I invited Dave. He actually came to Agile Maine. I don't know if it was years that you came, but what, uh, what kind of uh, uh, grabbed my attention? I think you asked, you know, there was a question around, How's a large-scale Scrum um, uh, in relation to complex adaptive systems? And he said that something along the lines is uh, less is not how you scale complex adaptive systems. And, uh, you know, my, my, I understand it from and kind of agree with him in a way that uh, depends what type of complex adaptive systems. If you're truly going from a complex adaptive system, uh, I agree with him. And... Uh, I don't know, what were your thoughts when he answered that question? What was going through your head and maybe reflectively looking at it? Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Um, so, I, so, first of all, I respect Dave and Dave's view, and he's a pretty well-known and very eloquent speaker, and he doesn't sanitize, and that's what, if nothing else, even if I would disagree with him, I would still respect him for his candid, blunt, and unsanitized views. Unsanitized mm -hmm. in the way that he doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't... He doesn't sugarcoat what he wants to say. Uh, I think um, he did uh, make, if I recall correctly, he did make some statements about less, uh, I, I need to actually go back to that video and replay what he said exactly. And I kind of knew that uh, I wasn't looking for him to uh, give any blessing or pave the road for less. In fact, I wasn't even aware of his um, you know, degree of understanding of what less is. Yeah. So I would expect he, he probably have read a, a plenty about less, uh, given that there were three books and then and, and the you know, and the very comprehensive website. So what I wasn't so much concerned about what he will or will not say about less. In fact, yeah. I wanted to complete. I know the the card card the card blanche I wanted to give him. Mm -hmm. What really outweighed it, and that's why I really 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 wanted his perspective. Was his uh, candid and the and un, un, you know un, uncensored view on some of the uh, challenges and dysfunctions that exist in the industry because of large consultancy business mm -hmm. and partnerships between large, uh, very expensive consultancies on one hand and very large, expensive but makes you feel good. Agile frameworks, and I'm not referring to less, and I will not even mention that <laughs> other X, Y, Z, E um, framework because people will figure out what that is. I think those come as a horse and carriage. Yeah. And he alluded to something. So that that was worth having him there, just that one few sentences. He referred, uh, referred us essentially to what he, he called it um, uh, an industrial model. Mm -hmm. When you when a consultancy gets overly big, a certain degree of si you know, size, size wise, in order to feed itself, it needs to generate business. So, if I'm a large consultancy and you're my client, I will not engage with you um, in a way that will produce uh, short, incremental, meaningful, sustainable results, because this sort of uh, engagement does not justify the effort for me. Because mm -hmm. I need to feed my cohorts <laughs> of, of, of workers that sit the back office people, right? So, but if I were to engage with you, I would engage, um, I would dig in for a long time. 
I would unpack and install something that is big, heavy, uh, you know, complex, and of course not cheap, right? Mm -hmm. I would always um, consider that plus the tooling solution. So I actually refer to this as a triple taxation. If you see mm -hmm. so some of my um, other cartoons. Graphics, yeah. yeah. A, tri triple, a triple taxation, large consultancy, big uh, scaling framework, and yeah. a monumental tooling solution. So it's a triple tax to an organization. You pay three times. If you live in a big city, city, state, government, right? and so, the city, local. Yeah, so uh, that's a really good point. And uh, if you look back at, you know, transformations, and if you look at the data, like, you know, from uh, if you look at it from your own personal experience, if you look at the data, you know, uh, at least when I do that, like 90 plus of these transformations, doesn't matter if it's agile, whatever, fail. And nobody talks about that. Agile is popular. Uh, and any of these, uh, uh, you know, lean was popular. <laughs> uh, any management fad that becomes yeah. mainstream is obviously popular. But why do you think, besides what you've said so far, that it's such a high rate? And do you agree with it? Do you think it's in, the, in that 90s range? And What, do you mean failures? Failures, yeah. Like in the sense it, like I, they fail... Yeah, I, I, I totally agree that majority of these transformations are a complete failure. I can't have, the, I don't have the numbers. I haven't ran the stats, but I can tell you majority of them are failing. But also what you have to, we have to understand is that very few companies will uh, openly admit to the fact that they have failed because yeah. it's a status quo, uh, especially if this is a large consultancy driven effort and multiple um, you know, credibilities are at stake. Who's going to ever say we have screwed up? Um, mm -hmm. You know, companies that are smaller and they are will. Oh, I shouldn't say smaller because this is really not size specific. This is uh, this is really based on the internal culture, which is secondary color to org structure, and mm -hmm. very much depends on the mindset of senior management. Um, I, if if they were in the experimental mode if they really wanted to do deep and narrow to try and see if it works <laughs> what fails what succeed what what, what what success then they wouldn't mind reporting back to the world that they have made some mistakes and then they have learned from them mm -hmm. uh, of course if they have engaged um not large consultancies that you know send armies of people to them you know at very high buck <laughs> but uh, maybe smaller people like you and I or some smaller boutique, more focused uh, organizations that help with agility, they would, they would be much more uh, comfortable to share back to the world with the world that, hey, some of the stuff we tried failed and some of it uh, materialized. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, it's all about <laughs> keeping your face, right? Um, above water, your head above water. If you, inve 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 invested 75 85 million dollars in the transformation and three four years down the road you did the books and you realized okay that's how much money we spent on this huge consulting firm but what did we gain from it and the and their answer is almost nothing or nothing then who is ever want to go on a record and say oh guys you know what we lost 85 billion million dollars <laughs> haven't really gained anything back and you know we're so brave we're gonna share share this with you yeah i mean it's but this isn't, isn't that like and what i've seen is like this is when the management or leadership changes right everybody gets a couple of years shot um uh, you you're out new guy comes in brings his own team this is you know uh, <laughs> what i've seen in, in many instances where a senior leader is hired to drive the transformation. They have their own team. They have the previous consultants that they work with. They have a shot at it. If they don't meet or the the board or the senior leadership at that company is not happy with it, they bring somebody else. And there is now a lot of that transparency. Sometimes you take two steps back, one step uh, uh, forward. Sometimes it's the other way around. Um, but as far as transparency, it, it's not very clear to the employees. And I think that's why uh, one of the things, you know, where people are so disengaged at work. 
And uh, if you lose, I always say you can easily. There's only one. It's like dating, right? I'm sure you and I have been there, right? <laughs> there's only one time you can make a first impression. Yeah. You screw up once, it's going to be very hard for you to get back on track and prove otherwise. So when a company, uh, when an organization uh, makes a bad impression on its individuals, and yeah. as such, and therefore, and therefore, um, and therefore, uh, d discourages, de incentivizes its own people, then it's going to be very difficult to gain back credibility and trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, so people will just shy away. Oh, that's another change management fad. And that's another management, you know, so organizational um, or, or rework 101. And we know it. Once people hear rework, people, oh, shit. Forgive my friend, cut it out. Uh, someone's going to be let go. Look, funny you say this in large scale Scrum, and I try to steer away from the from one of the things that I uh, try to do mo more 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 than less. <laughs> uh, we actually stress very strongly the difference between job security and role security. Mm -hmm. We want people to be safe in their jobs and be able to provide to them for themselves and, and their families, but it's not the same as a role security. Because a role security problem is that with that, we have lots of local optimization around individual roles. So if I'm our, if we're in business, you and I, where there are no longer, um, you know, guest, guest operated uh, uh, light bulbs out there in the street, then why do we need a role of someone who's going to be lighting them up at night? Mm -hmm. We have electricity, so we can rely on, on, on automatic switches. So if we optimize for that role, we're not going to be optimizing for the whole system. We'll be paying thousands of people for, 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 for the role that is no longer needed. Now, but these great people, maybe they have some other skills. We can repurpose these good people. That's a job security. So organizations need to understand that. And if they treat agile transformation as a way to get rid of people, well, that's, I think it's, it's, it's sad. <laughs>